We are continuing our series, Insights from Isaiah. So this morning we will be looking at the 29th chapter. You can tell we're certainly not going through every verse. We are quickly going through it. So Isaiah 29, we'll start in verse 9 in a few moments. Well, now that you've got your new football coach, we can talk a little bit about the hiring process. I mean the hiring process in general. I have no insider information about the hiring of the football coach. I just know what you know from what we've read and heard all week. I've never been involved in the hiring of a football coach, but I have been involved in the search process of hiring pastors or staff. I've been in the process in the sense that some have interviewed me seeking to hire me. And I've been in the process with some of you on committees seeking to hire staff members for this church. So anytime you hire a new staff member for a job, the committee invariably seeks to accentuate the positive. I mean, you show them the facilities, you talk about the opportunities for growth. I haven't read a uh, advertisement for a pastor's job description, I don't think, that doesn't say there's opportunity for growth. That's just one of the things you put in there. And you try to convince the candidate that they'll be meeting and working with some very wonderful people. It's not that you don't, or it's not that you hide the negative, it's simply that you don't bring it up unless asked. So no one tells the prospective pastor about the church member who's been a thorn in the flesh for the last three pastors and will likely be the same for him. No one mentions the financial struggles or the dysfunctional staff. No one talks about how the people fall asleep in every sermon, and you know who you are, (laughs) or the ones who simply refuse to listen to what the Bible has to say. I mean, no committee says these things. They don't talk about the negative to a prospective pastor because the pastor would not come to the church. I mean, if I were in a meeting and the search committee said to me, we really want you to be our next pastor, we really want you to come and preach God's word to our people, but we might as well be honest with you up front and let you know that they're not going to listen and they're not going to respond. Well, there's only one man I know who would accept such a calling. It is the man named Isaiah. I've mentioned beforehand his call to ministry in chapter 6, a a section that we did not do in this series because we've done it previously. It's a very famous passage where Isaiah gets a glimpse of the glory of God, and he hears the angelic chorus saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And because of that, he recognizes his own sinfulness and the sinfulness of the people among whom he lives. And symbolically then, there is this cleansing of his sin. It is a beautiful picture of salvation, and it is followed by service. So after all that, the Lord asks, who will go for me? And Isaiah famously says, here am I, send me. It's a wonderful picture of not only salvation, but also service after salvation. And because of that, it is one of our go-to passages for a missionary sermon. I mean, if you want to emphasize missions, Isaiah 6 is one of the best places to go. And yet, when Isaiah says, here am I, send me, that's where those missionary sermons end, including my own. We don't usually talk about the message that is immediately given after the call, a message that Isaiah is told to go and share. What is that message? Well, God says to Isaiah, I want you to go, but when you go, they will not hear because their ears are stopped. I want you to go, but they will not see because their eyes are blind. I I want you to go, but they will not turn and they will not be healed. And yet Isaiah is to go anyway. And so Isaiah asks the question, well, how long? How long am I going to do this and they not pay attention to me? And God's answer to Isaiah is until the land is destroyed and the people are devoured or deported. That's an awful odd way to start a prophetic ministry. But it is exactly what we're going to see this morning in chapter 29. 
Isaiah is going to be confronted with the very thing that God called him to do, an obstinate people who are not listening to him. And so today we are talking about hurting for healing. Because whether we like it or not, God often uses our hurts to ultimately bring about healing. And as we've just heard sung by our choir, I will not be shaken is fairly easy to profess on a Sunday morning. But in the midst of our hurts, I wonder if we can still make that claim. Isaiah 29, I'll begin reading in verse 9. Astonish yourselves and be astonished. Blind yourselves and be blind. Be drunk, but not with wine. Stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, the prophets, and covered your ears, the seers. And the vision of all of this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to the one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. And the Lord said, because this people draw near with me, draw near me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and their discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, who sees us, who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay? That the thing made should say of its maker, he did not make me, or the thing formed of him who formed it, he has no understanding? Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, And out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. For the ruthless shall come to nothing, and the scoffer cease. And all who watch to do evil shall be cut off. Who by a word make a man out to be an offender, and by a snare for, or lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate. And with an empty plea turn aside him who is in the right. Therefore, thus says the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall no more be ashamed, no more, no more shall his face grow pale. For when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will sanctify my name. They will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and will stand in awe of the God of Israel. And those who grow astray in spirit will come to understanding, and those who murmur will accept instruction. Well, that's a lot of verses that we're going to dissect this morning, but we're going to do it with just two points. Point number one is the fact that we need to talk about a current assessment. That is, we need to look at what is going on in the present as Isaiah is writing. And if we go back to our UT coaching search, the first thing the new coach is going to have to do is assess or uh, uh, look assess his current situation, if I can get the words out this morning. That is, he's going to have to look at his roster, he's going to have to look at the culture, he's going to have to look at all of those things that make up a football program and assess where they currently are before he can move forward. That's why in an interview, sometimes when I have an interview in the very way past, uh, they will ask me, what is your vision specifically for this church? And I think that's one of the oddest questions to ask a potential candidate. Because I'll say to them, how can I possibly know a vision for your particular church when I have no idea the current assessment of your church? I'm going to have to be on the ground for a while and assess what's going on before I can come up with a vision. Well, last week I mentioned to you that we've been going back and forth. This is the fifth sermon in this series, and sermons one and three were in the present, and sermons two and four were a picture of the future. Well, this morning we're going to do both. In our first point, we're going to look at the current assessment, and then in our second point, we're going to look at the future transformation. 
And so we start with this current assessment, and as we do, I want you to consider these three aspects of the current assessment. And as we consider these three aspects, I want you to ask yourself, how many of these are still true today? Now, I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer. The answer is D, all of the above. All three of these are problems in Isaiah's day, and all three of these are problems in our own day. The first is what I'm calling spiritual blindness. And you'll remember this is one of the things that God had told Isaiah at his calling. These are the chosen people of God. They have boasted about their relationship with him. These are the children of Abraham, and yet their spiritual vision is nowhere near 2020. Now let me remind you of the probable setting that involves this prophecy. The Assyrians are going to come and they are going to conquer the land. They will at this time fall short of actually conquering the city of Jerusalem, but the Babylonians will take care of that for them many years in the future. In fact, the first part of the chapter 29 that we did not read is a prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem. But the people didn't believe it. They just couldn't visualize it. God would never, God could never allow his people such destruction at the hands of pagan enemies. And this is instinctively what we think today, which is why we question, why do bad things happen to God's people? Why do we suffer? If we are the people of God, why is God allowing such horrible things into our lives? Well, God was going to allow it. In fact, that's not even the right way to say it. God was going to orchestrate it, not just allow it. Look at the terminology of verse 10. It was God that was closing their ears. It was God that was shutting their eyes because he fully intended to bring judgment upon them. And this was one of those who were supposed to be, uh, and this included those who were supposed to be leading the people, the prophets and the seers, other than Isaiah, of course. Isaiah seems to be the one lone voice that was hearing from God and speaking the truth and listening and believing. Verses 11 and 12 are two ex illustrations of what is taking place. A man is given a book and told to read. But he says, I cannot open the book because it is sealed. He doesn't want to put any, forth any effort in opening this book, though he is perfectly capable of doing so. The second man is a man who is also given a book and told to read, but he is not able to read. He doesn't know how to read, which means he's never made the effort to learn. So both illustrations speak of a unconcern or indifference, a people who cannot be bothered with the things of God. And again, is, that, is not this true in our own day? Where God is largely ignored, God is largely set aside from our lives until there is a personal or national tragedy. And then we cry out to him for his help, making promises of our commitment. Once we have his help, and then once we do have his help, we tend to go right back living the way we did before. It's the common thing we go through these days, and that is we often see the, the problems in other people's lives without seeing them in our own. So spiritual blindness. The second aspect of this current assessment is superficial worship. We've already touched on this a little bit in a previous sermon, but we see it again in verse 13. They are saying the right things and certainly continuing in their forms of worship, but they are not doing it with their hearts. Now, when I say hearts, this does not speak of emotions like we might think. It speaks rather of a totality or a depth of their being. Like, for example, when we come to church and there are times that we sing a song making great professions about our love or commitment to God or who God is, but deep down we know that we're just saying the words. We're not really understanding them or even believing them. Or like when you read your Bible sometime because we're going through a Bible reading plan and today's one of the days to read, so you got to read. And if someone were to ask you five minutes after you finished reading what it was about, you'd have a hard time explaining to them what you just read, which is a clear indication that your heart just wasn't in it. 
Now, just to illustrate that this is an ongoing issue, I'll jump to the New Testament, where we find Jesus in regular conflict with the religious leaders or rulers of his day. Now, we tend to look down, and rightfully so, upon those religious leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes, because they are in constant conflict with Jesus. But you need to understand that in their own day, they were not looked down upon. Rather, they were admired. They were admired for their religious commitment and for their righteous lives. And so one day they come to Jesus and complain that his disciples are breaking the laws, not the written laws of the Torah, but the oral laws of the rulers. They were breaking the laws and specifically the one about washing their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, what about the commandments that you continue to break? Isn't it amazing that we can get one rule on our minds that we expect not only ourselves but everybody else to follow and make judgments based on whether or not they're following that one rule that we think is ultimately important while we forget about all of the other ones. And that's what these Pharisees and scribes were doing and Jesus responds by calling them hypocrites. And then he quotes the verse that we've just talked about from Isaiah and says, Isaiah got it right. His prophecy was correct because the reality is you don't really care about the worship of God. On another occasion, he called them whitewashed tombs, which I think is a great picture of what we're talking about here. Whitewashed tombs. They looked good on the outside. Their righteous lives were available for all to see, but inside they were rotten and even dead. Their own doctrine was more important than God's, and again, they didn't have the eyes to see what they were doing. And this is a particular problem for those of us who have been in church for a long time, or specifically for those of us who have basically been in church all of our lives. Because we know the words to say. We can use the right Christian terminology. We've sung the songs before. We've read the verses before. And makes it all very easy to continue doing all of these things without engaging our hearts and to do that without even realizing it. And so we need to plead with God to warm our hearts and revive our souls so that we do not have the superficial worship that we see here in Isaiah and the superficial worship that we see in the hypocrites of Jesus' day and certainly the ongoing problem that we see in our own day. And so the third current assessment is secular wisdom. And this is where we need a little more background to help us understand what's going on. When Hezekiah became king, he nullified or broke the agreement that his father had made with the Assyrians. His father had made peace with the Assyrians by being submissive to them. But Hezekiah became king and declared his independence. But at the same time, he knew he needed help. He needed alliances and other nations to help him and safeguard the people against an Assyrian attack. And so he turned to Egypt for that alliance, even though historically they proved to be little, if any, help. And this was one of the major problems that God had with his people. Instead of trusting in him, that is God, they turned to these alliances with other nations. So when verse 15 is talking about their dealings in secret, we, we tend to think that they're hiding their sin because that's what we do. You know, we, we turn off the light and we think we can commit some sins without anyone seeing, including God. And while all of that is true, it's really not what verse 15 is talking about. Instead, verse 15 is really the picture of, of the leaders of Judah. Imagine huddled in a basement somewhere with just that one light bulb from the ceiling so that it's very dim in there. And they're huddled around a table making their alliance with Egypt, hoping that God won't see what they're doing. And yet God does. Look forward. You've got your Bibles open. By now you've understood that. So look at chapter 30, verse 1. Ah, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry on a plan but not mine, and who make an alliance, but not of my spirit, that they might add sin to sin. Here it is, who set out to go down to Egypt without asking for my direction, to take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. That's this secret alliance. They're seeking secular wisdom, which leads us back to verse 16, 
where I'm not sure you can find another verse that is more contemporary than this one. The world is turned upside down precisely because the relationship between God and man has been inverted. Many have forgotten that God is our creator and that we are his creatures. It's very similar to the song that the youth praise band sang last week about Job and those latter chapters of Job where, where Job is humbled by God when he asks him all these series of questions about where were you when I did all of this. And ultimately Job is humbled and he acknowledges that he spoke without thinking. Well, the same thing is happening here, although there is no humility because they do not see it because they are blind. And you know that ours is an age of autonomy, with everyone wanting to live their own lives however they see fit, with no outside interference, not even from God. It's my life. I only get one life to live, and it is mine, and I will do with it as I please. Which is akin to the pot claiming independence from the potter, and at the same time concluding that the potter just doesn't understand. But God does understand because he is our creator, and as our creator, he has more than the right to lead and control our lives. Paul uses the same imagery in Romans chapter 9 where he asks, who are you, O man, to answer back to God? He goes on to argue from common sense that the potter has a right to make of the clay whatever it is he wants to make. And it is only in an upside-down world that anybody would question that. And it is an upside-down world in which we live. Now, we could cite multiple cultural examples of how this is true, but all of it stems from forgetting God as the creator. And for us as believers, not only is God our creator, but God is our recreator. He's redeemed us, which means he's bought us with a price. Therefore, we, in some sense, doubly belong to him. Well, having completed this current assessment, let's move forward to the second half of our text. It starts in verse 17, and here we examine the future transformation. Here is the future, the vision of what God is going to do in the days to come. And the radical change is pictured in verse 17 with a forest that becomes a field and vice versa. This is the healing that God intends to bring about through the hurt, which is why my title is Hurting for Healing. Or we could call it something else. We could talk about glory through suffering. We know that Jesus had to endure the suffering of the cross before he was glorified, and we are called to follow him in that same path, certainly not a cross, but suffering before glory. This will be a comprehensive transformation that begins with physical transformation. The blindness and the dullness of hearing that we talked about a few moments ago will be reversed. And we certainly see this in the earthly ministry of Jesus. Once when John, the forerunner of Christ, was in prison. And I love this, I love this scene because it's reality for us. John, the forerunner of Christ, who is suffering in prison, is beginning to doubt and so he asked some of his followers to go to Jesus and ask this question, are you the one to come or should we look for another? John, the forerunner, is beginning to wonder if this is really the one we're to follow. And Jesus answers them and says, go back and tell John what is happening. And as part of his answer, he says, the blind are receiving the sight and the deaf are able to hear again. The very things we see here in Isaiah of course, we also know that he's not just talking about physical sight nor physical healing. He's also talking about a spiritual transformation here, which is our second aspect of this transformation. In verse 18, there is joy and exaltation, telling us that this is not just an outside physical transformation, but this is an internal transformation as well. Now, we need to look at some of the words here because they're somewhat foreign to us. Meek is a word we've heard, but it's not a word we really quite understand. It sounds a lot like weakness to us, and so we really don't like it all that much, preferring instead to talk about how we must assert ourselves. No one else is going to, so you need to assert yourself. But meekness is not weakness. It is more like gentleness, a self-control empowered by the Spirit of God. 
And this is a quality that we should desire. After all, in the beatitude portion of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So meekness is a kingdom quality. In fact, it goes beyond that. Meekness is a requirement for the kingdom. And then in the ESV, from which I'm reading, we see the word exult, which again is a word that we don't use very often, so it might be confusing. So how do we solve that? Well, one of the easiest ways when you come across a word in your translation that you don't understand is to go to another translation. Whether you have that lying around the home or you have it digitally, go to another translation and look up the same verse and see how that translation translated the word. So I did that with the word exult. I looked at three other major translations and all three of them used the word rejoice. And so we know more about what that word means and we get a better understanding of what's taking place here. And they are rejoicing in the Holy One of Israel, a title that you will recall week one, we said in all likelihood was coined by Isaiah because it is found so frequently in his letter and yet so infrequently everywhere else. And then thirdly, physical transformation and spiritual transformation. And thirdly, there is social transformation. Another of the big questions we face as Christians is not just why do bad things happen to good people, but we also struggle with the opposite. Why do good things happen to bad people? Why do the wicked seem to prosper? Why do they seem to be the ones that have everything in life, and yet those of us who are trying to faithfully follow God seem to have more suffering and struggle? And that question is nothing new. It's found throughout the Psalms, and so we're not the first to experience it. There is inequality in this world, but if we look carefully and take a longer and broader perspective, we also notice that God promises to reverse these things. We see this in verses 20 and 21. Those who are currently prospering apart from a relationship with God are going to be brought to nothing. Those who are working evil will certainly not be part of the coming kingdom. And one of the places we see this abuse is in the legal system where money can often buy a verdict and power can yield results, things that the poor and the oppressed do not have access to. And so verse 21, there are three abuses of the legal system that are mentioned here. The first is false testimony, which we know is still prevalent today in spite of our pledge to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. There are plenty of people who will lie on the stand again, for power or for money. The second one is tampering with evidence, something that seems to happen in every crime drama we watch on television. But it's not just on crime dramas, it is also in real life where it continues to happen. Again, the powerful will often do whatever is necessary to stay in power, even at the expense of the powerless. And then the third abuse here is the outright denial of protection from the law, turning people away so they cannot have access to justice. And I want you to understand again that I'm not picking texts in Isaiah that deal with social justice because that's a hot item in our day today. I'm not doing it. But every text we've looked at has dealt with that because it is an ongoing theme in Isaiah's day and a widespread abuse then and again now. And because God wants us to see that he sees the injustice and that there is coming a time when he will transform everything and make it right. Finally, we see religious transformation. Now, I know the word religion is a bad term these days to a lot of people. Even people who are active in church, they will say something they think sounds spiritual I want you to know I'm not religious. It's all about a relationship. Doesn't that sound good? But for the life of me, I don't know why we were shy of the word religion. It's a good word. The word religion simply means belief in and worship of a God, especially a personal God. So I'm religious, and I hope you are as well. Now, I do acknowledge that religious transformation is very close to spiritual transformation. In fact, we we might say they're identical. But frankly, just to be clear, I needed a fourth point to go with verses 22 through 24. So I had to come up with another word. So here we see that there will be a time when the descendants of Jacob will declare among themselves 
and to the world that God is the true God. That's what the word sanctify means. They're going to declare God to be the true God. And this, sanctific- uh, this uh, sanctifying will replace shame. And then they will stand in awe. That's the phrase that's used here, and that's the phrase we used last week to define this particular aspect of the fear of God that we saw Jesus delighted in. And then he speaks of the joy of seeing future generations, children and grandchildren, praising the name of God. Now, we've talked before about the opposite. That is the heartache that you and I experience when our children turn away from the faith. But here it's the positive, God dealing graciously with future generations and those future generations loving and serving God. And if you have children who are faithfully walking in the truth, you know what a thrill that is. In John's third epistle, John writes, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And that no doubt applies not just to physical children, but that applies to spiritual children. And what I mean by that is if you're a children's or youth Sunday school teacher, if you teach them on Wednesday nights, if you help out in those ministries in any way, you know that when some of those children rise up and become young adults and you see them faithfully following the Lord, it is a great encouragement to your heart to see that they are doing what you and others trained them to do. So we've seen in our text that God was bringing about hurt in the people's lives, but he was doing it for a purpose. They could not imagine why God would use pagan enemies to conquer their lands and their cities and ultimately deport the survivors. But the fact of the matter is sometimes God has to bring us down before he can lift us up. Sometimes it is necessary for us to find ourselves in times of difficulties so that we will wholeheartedly turn to him and find healing. If you ever look at our prayer list, you know that that prayer list is dominated by physical issues. That is, there are people on the prayer list who are in nursing homes or who are in hospitals trying to recover from something. There are people who have sicknesses and are at home. There are others who have had surgeries and they are striving to heal. So there are a lot of prayer requests for physical uh, healing. Now, a lot of people then call in to me or the church office and they say to us, hey, uh, on Tuesday, I'm having surgery for such and such. Now, what if I were to say to them when they called in, are you sure you want to do that? You really sure you want to have that surgery? Because I'm going to tell you, you know what they're going to do? They're going to put you to sleep and they're going to cut open your body. That That doesn't sound like much fun. They're going to cut open your body. And then when they're done with whatever they're doing in there, they're going to sew it back up, and you are going to be in a lot of pain. They're going to have you on medication, and for days or even weeks, depending on the surgery, you are going to be in a lot of pain. And if it involves the replacement of a joint, you're going to have to go to a rehab facility where they're going to do some physical therapy on you, and it's going to hurt. And it's going to hurt for weeks, if not months. So I want to encourage you, don't do it. It is too painful. Now, what are they going to say to me? They're going to say, yes, I know it's going to hurt. I've watched the videos. I've heard what they said. But after those weeks and months are over with, the hurt's going to be gone, and I'm going to be healed. So the hurt is worth it for the healing. Now, what if we started thinking like that when it comes to our spiritual lives? What if we began to trust God in the midst of our suffering and pain? And realize that God might just be allowing the hurt in our lives because ultimately he's healing us. Now the hurt might last longer than a few weeks or even months. But with the perspective of eternity, it's still a short period of time. And as we saw previously, with the glory that's going to be revealed to us, the pain doesn't compare. So let's trust that even in the midst of our hurting, God is using it for our healing. Let me pray. Father, we do thank you, even for the times in our lives where, where we doubt, where we wonder why you're allowing certain things. And as a result, we often fail to, to trust that you know what you're doing, but you are the creator. 
and you have a design and plan for our lives that is for our good and your glory. And so I pray that even in the midst of those days and weeks, maybe even years of hurt, that you would remind us that maybe not in this life, but certainly in the life to come, we will be healed completely. And the hurt will not compare to the glory of the healing. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. And you receive.